exam study guide check sheet kind of to guide me through the topics that could be on the lab exam. Yeah. I'm recording this, yeah. So you guys, if you want to blast off, you can. I totally get it that, that making most efficient use of your time is important, okay? So you guys, first of all, what we want to do is just ask, do you all have questions? Like in preparing for the lab exam, did you run across some topics where it's like, I really didn't get this concept or I wish we could go over this again? Yeah. The, uh, the adjectives and the mediums. Okay. Oh, the selective and differential yeah. media. So you guys, this is chapter 10, unit 10, microbial growth media. And that is a tough one. So I'm, I'm really glad you asked about it. Okay. Is, do you want me just to kind of review it in general or is there a special topic you want me to ask? Yeah, just, just kind of in general. Okay. Okay, you guys, so again, this is kind of like off the top of my head, but folks, in um, Chapter 10, Unit 10, Microbial Growth Media, remember we are classifying media based on different properties. So we said one way to classify them is are they solid or liquids? So you guys, um, if I asked you what is the advantage of growing your microbes on auger plates compared to growing them in broth, can you think of one advantage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, 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 good job, you guys. So if I held up a, let me see here. If I just held up, you guys, let's pretend this is um, broth. And you can see there's um, turbidity, right, that indicates cells are present. But you guys, can you tell me, is this pure or a mixed culture? You can't, right? So that's a big disadvantage of broth cultures. In contrast, you guys, if you took some of that culture and then streaked it out on an auger plate, do you have a better idea of whether your culture is pure or mixed? You would, yeah, and why is that? What can we see on the auger plate that we can't see in the broth? Colonies. The colonies, right? And remember, you guys, our, our understanding is different types of microbes will make different types of colonies, right? Um, so with an auger plate, if we get isolated colonies and we look at colony morphologies, if the colonies all look pretty much the same, it, it suggests we might have a pure culture, okay? And we, we have really no idea with broth. So that's a really important concept. So you guys, an isolated colony, if our hypothesis is um, that all the cells in that colony, and there's like 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 cells, they're all descended from a single, say, bacterium or a single yeast or single fungal spore. Um, so that means all of the cells in that colony, they should be genetically um, similar, right? So that means an isolated colony represents a pure culture of an organism, a single type of a microbe. And that's why, folks, we can use our auger plates to take an initially mixed culture where there's multiple types of microbes growing. By having additional um, auger plates, we can transfer cells from an isolated colony to a new plate, and in 24 hours, we can have pure cultures. And you guys, why are pure cultures important in microbiology? For doing tests, yeah, for doing, say, antibiotic sensitivity testing, doing metabolic tests, right? And in lecture, you guys, we're going to talk about, um, to prove the germ theory of disease, um, uh, Robert Koch developed four prerequisites to prove a specific microbe causes a specific infectious disease, and pure cultures are absolutely essential in, in proving that a specific microbe causes a specific um, infectious disease. Good. Okay. And then, folks, we talked about that um, we could classify our media based on functional type. So the ones that we talked about are all-purpose media. And what's an example, folks, of all-purpose medium? The one that we, we used? Okay, auger is a solidifying agent. What's the name of the auger that we used that we said was all-purpose? The TSA, the triptych soy auger. All-purpose meaning it'll support the growth of a wide range of bacteria and um, fungi yeasts and molds. Good, you guys. Um, then, in our airborne experiment, folks, we also use a selective me media, the sab roads the dextrose media. And sab um, auger is selective for which groups of microbes? Fungi. And you guys, the fungi, who we would be growing on our sab plates would be yeasts and who else? Molds. Good, right? And you guys, if we're selecting, permitting the growth of the fungi, that means we're inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. So how do we inhibit the growth of the bacteria in sab auger? Lower the pH, right? So in general, in general, most fungi can grow at lower pH than most, say, environmental microbes. Good, you guys. All right. 
So um, we said that SAB is selective for fill in the blank. Fungi, Fungi good. Um, then, folks, we introduce, and it, this does get confusing, we introduce some other media. Um, so let me, let me pull out some of the other media, folks, that, that we talked about. And so, do you remember we had some wonderful volunteers that ag agreed to do nasal swabs and throat swabs, right? And we said that when we're trying to grow microbes from patients, we need to remember that often the human microbes are fastidious. What does fastidious mean? They have to have a lot of preformed organic molecules, what we call growth factors, because they can't make much for themselves. So growth factors includes vitamins and um, nucleic acid, nitrogenous base precursors, and amino acids, right? So we need to grow our microbes on really, really rich medium. So you guys, in a medical microdiagnostic lab, if you get a sample from a patient, to make sure that you're going to feed your fastidious microbes, you're always going to plate your sample to what? Enrichment medium, and what's probably the most famous enrichment medium? Blood auger, right? It's got everything in it that your fastidious microbes make. So you guys, would you classify blood auger then as all-purpose, minimal, enrichment? enrichment? Enrichment, good. Now, folks, in addition, we said that blood auger is differential. The microbes that grow on it, we can start to differentiate them based on which cool property. Homolysis, good, breaking down the red blood cells. And so, folks, remember we said that there's three different types of homolysis. What are they? Beta homolysis. We'll do them one at a time, you guys. So beta homolysis. How does beta homolysis appear on a blood auger plate? Complete clearing of the auger, right? You're getting lysis of the red blood cells and destruction of the content. So you could actually read through the auger. This is important, you guys. We made a big deal about it. So let's say we have three different patients, and we've isolated gram-positive cocci um, from three different patients, and we're trying to figure out who these gram-positive cocci are. So we're going to be using our blood auger to help us out. So you guys, so just as we did in lab, you guys, we take a throat swab. Maybe somebody has a sore throat. Take a throat swab inoculator blood auger. We incubate, and when we pull it out the next day, we see these little tiny... Um, colonies with beta homolysis around them. What's a possibility for that particular pathogen? It is, you're right, you guys. I mean, we did pull out staph from the throats of, of um, some of the folks. But let me, how should I, I know it. What if you guys, when you looked in your patient's mouth, you, in the back of the throat, you saw these little white patches of dead and dying white blood cells? You got it. What we're thinking of is strep throat, right? And what's the scientific name of the pathogen that causes strep throat? Streptococcus pyogenes. And you guys remember pyogenes literally means pus producer, right? So streptococcus pyogenes, what kind of homolysis would it cause on blood auger? The beta homolysis, right? So you guys, so if we, we see little white patches in the back of the throat and we get little colonies that are beta hemolytic, it suggests these could be streptococcus pyogenes. Would we want to do additional tests to verify? Yeah, we would. Oh, oh my gosh, you guys, I got it. Okay. You had a great, great um, differential there, you guys. You said staph aureus, because we know staph aureus, gram positive cocci, beta hemolytic. Which fast test could you do, you guys, to distinguish between staphylococcus aureus and streptococcus pyogenes? One we just talked about? Okay, that would be for antibiotic sensitivity. What did we, a quick bench top test you guys did on Monday? Yeah, yeah, you guys, right? So, I mean, you probably want to do other tests, but you guys remember Staphylococcus aureus would be catalase positive, and Streptococcus pyogenes would be catalase negative. Yeah, it's awesome. It's an awesome test. Good job. All right, folks, so, and now let's keep going. So what else do we have here? Oh, no, hemolysis. Sorry, I got carried away. So you guys, what if, um, let's have, let's, um, let's say one of your patients is a pregnant patient. You do a vaginal swab. You plate it to blood auger, and you get little beta hemolytic colonies the next day. 
what are you afraid of? Why would you be concerned? Group B streptococci, right? So remember, you guys, the group B strep, they can cause neonatal meningitis and septicemia, right? Easily treated with antibiotics, but we should be screening all of our pregnant moms, right, for group B strep. Good job, folks. Um, let's say, I think the example we used before, you guys, was an infected surgical site, right? So it's pussy. You streak it to blood auger plates. You get um, big beta hemolytic colonies that are catalase positive. Who could that be? Staph aureus, right? Yeah, and again, really worried because Staph aureus, we'll learn, is highly invasive and often it's resistant to multiple antibiotics. Good job, folks. Um, oh, I know you guys. Oh, ooh, okay. Um, no, I can't do that yet. Okay, remember Staph aureus. I have to come back and follow up on that. Okay, so we did beta hemolytic, you guys. Which three bacteria do we want to remember? Staph aureus. Strep pyogenes and group B strep. Good. What about alpha hemolysis? You guys remember when we did the throat swabs and we put them on the blood auger, incubated, a lot of the colonies cause this greenish discoloration to the blood auger. What do we call that greenish discoloration? That's alpha hemolysis, right? So you guys, what's um, a gram-positive caucus that can contribute to dental caries and periodontal disease that is alpha hemolytic? Streptococcus mutans, right? Makes a slime layer, makes the biofilms, good. And you guys, what if it was a patient, an older patient recovering from influenza, and now you think they might be suffering from maybe bacterial pneumonia? And you, you take a, a sample, a respiratory secretion sample, and you plate it, and you get lots of um, alpha hemolytic um, gram positive. And let's say you, you know it's going to be a member of the genus um, Streptococcus. If these bacteria truly came from the lower respiratory tract, you guys, which alpha hemolytic Streptococcus are you worried about? Streptococcus pneumonia. Awesome. Streptococcus pneumonia. Well done, you guys. Awesome. Okay. So, you guys, we did beta hemolytic. What are the two alpha <laughs> hemolytic bacteria we wanted you to remember? Streptococcus mutans and Streptococcus pneumonia. Good. And what about gamma hemolysis? What's gamma hemolysis? It's nothing, right? So most microbes, you guys, are gamma hemolytic. There's going to be no impact on blood. Good. Can we go back to that staph aureus case? Okay. Because it's like, you know, just getting the beta hemolytic colonies on the blood auger. If, if we had, like, a, a suspect staph infection, right, we'd inoculate our blood auger. But you guys, what other media could we inoculate that's going to select for members of the genus Staphylococcus and would also let us differentiate between Staphylococcus aureus and its less virulent cousin, Staphylococcus epidermidis? Do you remember the differential selective media we would use? Good. MSA. What does MSA stand for, folks? Manitol salt auger. Awesome. So you guys, if I ask you to make 100 mils of MSA, how much sodium chloride would you add? So remember, it's 7.5% weight per volume. That's 7.5 grams per 100 mils. Good. So if I ask you to make a liter of MSA, how many grams of sodium chloride are you going to add? 75 grams. Good. What, what's the function of the sodium chloride? It's an inhibitor. It's going to inhibit who? Microbes that can't grow at high salt concentrations, right? So you guys, so that means we're selecting for who? Who's going to grow? Salt yeah, salt tolerant microbes that maybe have evolved to live on, say, skin. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can Staph aureus live on salty skin? Yes, yes it sure can. Good. Um, Okay, so you guys, MSA is selective for, how would you describe the selective properties of MSA? <coughs> yeah, we'll select for salt-tolerant bacteria such as members of the genus Staphylococcus. Awesome, you guys. But, folks, we say that mannitol salt auger is also differential. It lets us differentiate between our highly virulent Staphylococcus aureus and it's less virulent cousin, Staphylococcus epidermidis. Remember, you guys, we, we tested Staph epi, right? So you guys, how do we differentiate Staph aureus from Staph epi on mannitol salt auger? Color. Okay, now give me more. Give me more, you guys. 
Why is mannitol in mannitol salt auger? Is that the differential ingredient? It is, right? So you guys, mannitol, if mannitol is fermented, do we get acids produced? Yes, it's a sugar alcohol. We're going to get acids produced. What's going to happen to the pH? It'll go down, right? Would it help if we had a pH indicator in here? What's our default pH indicator, you guys, if we can't think of anything? Phenol red, right? So you guys, what color is phenol red at acidic pH? Yellow, okay? So if mannitol is fermented, what color should the auger turn? Yellow. If the microbe can't ferment mannitol, they tear apart amino acids, release ammonia, causing an alkaline reaction. What color is phenol red, folks, at an alkaline pH? Red. Good. So, folks, if I told you one of these plates is Staph aureus and the other is Staph epidermidis, and if I tell you Staph aureus can ferment mannitol and Staph epi cannot ferment mannitol, which MSA plate do you think is Staph aureus, the yellow one or the red one? The yellow one, right? So Staph aureus is mannitol positive, ferments mannitol, drops a pH, phenol red, turns yellow. Okay, so you guys, if I ask you about MSA plate, are they in... Um, are, is MSA enrichment? No. Um, is MSA all-purpose? No. no. Is MSA selective? Yes. Is MSA differential? Yes. Okay, you guys all right with that one? Okay. And then, folks, let's hear. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, no. Are the SAB plates um, enriched? Okay, so you guys, are the SAB plates enriched? And you ask the question, who grows on it? Mostly fungi, right? So enrichment means everybody's going to grow on it, even the fastidious microbes. So SAB is not enrichment. And indeed, you guys, you, to make SAB, you take TSA basically and you acidify it. So it starts out all purpose, but by, by um, acidifying it, you make it selective for fungi. Yeah, good question. All right, you guys, and for some reason, I can't find our McConkie's plates. Um, so you guys, let me just ask you then, um, we worked with another, or had another selective differential media. Do you remember what that one was? McConkie's, right? And you guys, it actually ties in, in fact, it actually would be a great lab exam question to tie in McConkie's and um, the Invic tests. So you guys, remember we said that McConkie's, um, it's selective for which group of bacteria? The Enterobacteriaceae, good job, you guys. It's selective for Enterobacteriaceae, and it's differential. And you remember, it's differential based on which property? The ability to ferment lactose. And you guys remember, lactose is kind of rare in nature. So we would predict only microbes that have evolved in the intestinal tracts of mammals might evolve beta-galactosidase, right? The enzyme that you need to be able to ferment lactose. Okay. But, folks, remember in Enterobacteriaceae, there's so many cousins, and a lot of them can ferment lactose, but a lot of them can't ferment lactose. So, you guys, if we have some unknown Enterobacteriaceae, and we played it to McConkie's medium, how would the colonies appear if the microbe can ferment lactose? What color will the colonies appear? Pink. Good. And, folks, if you're... If your Enterobacteriaceae can't ferment lactose, how would the colonies appear? Not pink, colorless? Okay, so remember, it, McConkie's is selective and differential. So you guys, and this is just my thought. It's like, ooh, this could be kind of delicious. So let's say that, you know, with all the power outages going on, right? Um, a lot of people are on well water. Um, you know, there's fires, damage to sewer systems, all of this. So let's say you have an outbreak of diarrheal disease, maybe in an area where the fires and the power outages have been going on. And these are folks all on wells, right? And so you go to 10 houses and get the well water, and you plate it to McConkie's Media, okay? And let's say half the, house, half the houses, when you plate their water, you get lots and lots of pink colonies. Would you be worried for those folks? Yeah, because what might those pink colonies be? Might be E. coli, so who cares? You got E. coli in your drinking water. Why would that worry you? Fecal contamination, right? But you guys remember how we said um, E. coli and Enterobacter orogenes, they look really similar. They both ferment lactose with gas production. So you guys, maybe this was just like 
you know, runoff from surrounding forest or somewhere, right? Maybe it's just Enterobacter rogenes. Which tests would you run to distinguish E. coli from Enterobacter rogenes? Okay, well, and maybe a series of tests, you guys? I mean, you're right. You're absolutely right. The test. Maybe the Invic test, right? And the reason is, you guys, because in that big family, Enterobacter yeastii, a bunch of them will be indole positive, a bunch will be indole negative. So it's, it's actually good to run the Invic test together. Okay, so you guys, so let's say in the five houses, you ran Invic tests on all of the pink colonies. And all of those, all the pink colonies from all five houses, they gave the MVIC results positive, positive, negative, negative. Are you now really worried or less worried? Really worried. Why? Because that is sounding like E. coli. And again, you guys, who cares? If E. coli is in our water, who cares? Yeah, fecal contamination. So could a wide variety of fecal <laughs> pathogens be present, right? It's not just the E. coli we're worried about, you guys. It's, it's that it's telling us that any of those fecal pathogens could be present. And you guys, I'll just make this up. But let's say all five um, well water samples, when you tested the pink colonies, the MVIC results came back negative, negative, positive, positive. Are you really freaked out and worried? Maybe a little less so, right? Because th this could be just runoff from decaying organic matter. It doesn't necessarily mean there's fecal contamination, especially if you're not recovering E. coli, right? It's hard for me to imagine that you'd have fecal contaminated food or water and not get E. coli out of it. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right, so it's kind of an integration, integration type question. Okay, and I think that was it, you guys, on the media. I, I, I agree, you guys. I think that's a that's a tough unit. It's a lot to wrap your minds around. Yeah, so I'm really glad you brought it up. Is it any clearer now, you guys, or is it just clear as mud? Okay, all right. So you guys, again, what we want to do first is just answer questions that you have, like topics that were confusing. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you guys, brain, heart, and fusion is another example of um, enrichment media. We used to use it a lot. And um, the reason it's called brain, heart, and fusion is you take from slaughter yards, you get brains and hearts from cattle. But you guys, why do you think we stopped using it? it has to do with the topic we're discussing in lecture. Prion disease, right? So if we had mad cow disease here in, here in California, you guys, and there were cattle that were infected, um, what part of the body is going to be really, really rich in prions? The brains, right? And actually, a student brought this up several years ago because we used to use BHI, and we do um, hand washing experiments. Like, we, we touch our fingers to the surface of the brain heart infusion auger and then wash our hands and touch it again. And a student brought up, they're like, ha, huh, cattle brains in the auger were touching it. And they brought up, it's like, well, is this a public health issue? We're like, that's a very good point. We're going to stop using it. Yeah. So, so folks, on our lab exam, if I ask you for an example of enrichment media that we discuss, what are you going to say? Blood auger. Awesome. Good. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, folks, other other questions? Yeah. 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 Did you cut transmission for Oh, taniosolium is tough. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you guys, transmission on taniosolium and, and ascaris? Okay, so you guys, um, so if I ask you, let's say a child presents and is infected with ascaris lumbricoides, okay, the human roundworm. So you guys, let me just quiz you a little bit here. So is ascaris a nematode, a trematode, or a cestode? Nematode, right? Roundworm, good. How, how did the child get infected? Fecal oral, right? So an infected person has adult um, ascaris living in the intestine. The females lays eggs. They pass in the feces. And unfortunately, you guys, the feces can remain infectious for a long time, months, maybe years, in the soil. Okay, So fecal contaminated soil is a reservoir. But of course, if there's fecal contamination of food or drinking water. So you guys, we swallow the eggs. The eggs hatch in the intestine. The baby worms, the larva, penetrate the intestines, they get into the blood vessels, and their goal is to get up to the lungs. So when they reach the lungs, they penetrate through the blood vessel capillaries into 
the alveolar spaces, right? The air spaces. And then where do they go? Yep. Just crawl up the trachea and you'll feel a tickle. And what, what do you do when you feel a tickle in the back of your throat? You cough <laughs> and swallow. So that's how the immature worms reach the intestines again. They survive passage through the, in, um, the stomach. They usually have like, they don't have a cell wall, you guys, but they have a cuticle that protects them, right? And then they mature into adults in the intestine, and they sexually reproduce, and then they lay eggs, and the cycle starts all over again. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. So you guys remember of, of concern would be if, um, like a child or, or an adult has heavy, heavy in infestation, like where the worms can actually block the intestinal tract, right? That's, that could be really serious, yeah. Okay, and then you guys, tania solium. Is, it's confusing because tania solium can be transmitted two different ways. Okay, so can you name the two different ways you guys tania solium can be transmitted? Fecal orally, we swallow the eggs, right? And then if we, good, if we in, ingest um, pork that hasn't been properly cooked, pork that contains the resting stage, the cystocerci, right? So let's do the worst one. To me, this is the worst one. So folks, if we swallow the tania solium eggs in fecal contaminated food or water, the eggs hatch in the intestine and they're gonna go traveling, right? And um, of great concern is they can travel where? Up to the brain, right? And form those little resting cystocerci. So if you have a person that's getting continually um, infected through fecal contaminated food or water, can their brain end up looking kind of like Swiss cheese? But, but they aren't holes, you guys, it's the resting cystocerci? Yeah. And again, you guys, I was blown away. Um, they said that tania solium, cystocercosis, neurocystocercosis, it is one of the leading causes of epilepsy worldwide. I was like, are you, wow, I had no idea. Okay, so you guys, how do we develop neurocystocercosis? Fecal oral, right, okay. But, you guys, the second transmission, why is tania solium called the pork tapeworm? Right, can pigs swallow the eggs and have the cystocerci in their muscle, right? So if we slaughter the, the pig and eat the muscle, which we would then call pork, and we don't cook it well enough to kill the cystocerci, right? We ingest the pork with the cystocerci, they pass through the stomach, they emerge in the intestine, and then remember you guys, they have that proglotted, not, not for the so you guys, scolex. And you guys, what, what do they have on their scolex, their head? Hooks and suckers. And so then they use their hooks and suckers to attach to the um, intestinal mucosa. And then they start growing those proglottids, right? And the function of the proglottids is to make hundreds and hundreds of eggs. And then the cycle starts all over again. Does that help? Yeah, tinea solium is tough because there's two different ways. Good. Yeah. And it... Did that, did that answer? You guys, um, just one last one. Tania solium, is it a nematode, a trematode, or a cestode? Cestode, good. Okay, and then, Chloe, do you have questions? I was just going to ask, so you just went over it, but I just want to clarify. Like sure. The vector of, t uh, of tania solium is fixed. Um, we wouldn't call that the vector. It's a reservoir. It's a source. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, usually, like the way we talk about vectors here, you guys, when we talk about vectors, we're going to say they have to be arthropods, you know, like insects or ticks. So in the case of tania solium, we would say the pigs are a reservoir. They're a source of how we get infected. Does, does that, and I know you guys, we haven't gotten to the medical micro yet where we're going to talk about reservoirs and transmission. But yeah, I would call the pigs more a reservoir than I would a vector. Yeah. So you guys, do you want me, go ahead, sorry, Chloe. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the infectious form, you guys, well, and it kind of, so the infectious form for the mosquitoes are the microfilaria, the microfilaria that circulate in the peripheral blood at nighttime. So when the female mosquito bites, she sucks up the microfilaria and then she gets infected. The microfilaria are also one of the diagnostic stages, right? Because you guys, you'd want to take a blood sample from your patient at night and then look for those little microfilaria in the blood, right? So that's diagnostic for, um, say, a Wuchereria infection. Um, what happens in the mosquitoes, the larvae actually go through development. 
So it's still an, um, a larval, an immature form, you guys, that we get injected with. Um, but I think on the lab exam, what would be important for us to know is it's the microflare that end up infecting the mosquitoes, and it's also the microflare that are a diagnostic stage. We'd be looking for those in the blood of humans that are infected. Yeah, good. Do you guys want me to just quiz you really quick on the vectors? Just really quick? Okay, so you guys, um, Yersinia pestis is a bacterial pathogen that causes which disease here in California? <clears throat> Bubonic plague, good. And what's one way that we can get infected? Through the bite of fleas, right? Okay, so that's one way we can get infected is through the bite of infected fleas, good. So another way of saying that, you guys, the arthropod vector of bubonic plague is fleas. Good. Um, Trypanosoma cruzii causes which infectious disease? Chagas disease. Chagas disease, also known as American trypanosomiasis. What's the vector? The triatoma or reduvid <clears throat> bugs. Good, you guys. Um, Trypanosoma brucei causes which infectious disease? Sleeping sickness, also known as African trypanosomiasis. What's the vector? Glossina. Good. The CT fly. Good job, you guys. Um, uh, okay. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi is a bacterial spirochete which causes which infectious disease in California? And this is an important one, you guys, because if you go hiking, picnicking, camping, Lyme's disease. Lyme's disease. Good. The specific tick, exactly, here in California, the tick vector is called Exodes specific. It's the western black-legged tick. You are spot on. Good. Are yeah. Are the distinction between the ticks? Or can you oh, no. Oh, heavens, no. No, 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 no. Yeah. So, you guys, so if we had, like, a picture of a tick, mm -hmm. I'd want you to know that's a tick. Mm -hmm. And I would want you to know, um, probably it would be a bonus question if I asked you for the scientific name of the tick. That would be a bonus question, Exodes pacificus. But just knowing the tick are the vectors of Lyme disease would be sufficient. So, you guys, a bonus one would be for the, um, in Southern California, the Rickettsia typhi that causes typhus. Um, do you know a vector for Rickettsia typhi? It's actually fleas. Yeah, but that's a bonus one, you guys. That was a bonus one. Okay, I know I'm forgetting something here. Oh, my gosh, how could I forget? So you guys, um, plasmodium causes malaria. malaria, and what's the name, the genus name of the mosquitoes that transmit it? Anopheles. Anopheles. Well done, you guys. Do we have Anopheles mosquitoes in Northern California? Yeah. yeah, we do. Good. You guys, in general, what's the name of the vector that would transmit West Nile virus? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Good. Um, yeah. What's the from the vector of Rickettsia Okay, so Exodes is, is the vector of Borrelia burgdorferi that causes Lyme disease. Okay, yeah. You guys, if, if I know I'm forgetting them. So you guys just yell at me if there's one that I'm forgetting. I know I'm forgetting some. Okay. Do you guys have any, any other vector-borne vectors or vector-borne pathogens you want to go over? And for helmets, you guys, um, so can you name two helmets that have fecal oral transmission? Tania solium awesome and Asteris lumbricoides. Good job, you guys. Can you name two helmets, um, two helmets that could cause infection in humans um, if the humans eat undercooked pork. Tania solium, right? And the other one is? So I think of cinnamon buns. Trichinella spiralis, I know. So I swear to gosh, you guys, one of, one of the best professors we had, he had a food analogy for everything. And that it just made it so, or you're like, oh, jelly donuts. Oh, cinnamon buns. Anyway, because it's something we identify with. Good. Um, folks, if, if you have family or friends that are, say, bear hunters, um, is there a helmet that we studied um, that could cause infection if you eat undercooked bear or walrus or seal? 
that actually citricinella again. Yeah, it is. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Um, so you guys, what's the name of the helmet that causes lymphatic filariasis? Good. Wufferi Bancrofti. Well done, you guys. Okay, so we did fecal oral. We did ingestion of pork. We did mosquitoes. I'm forgetting. Why are I forgetting something, you guys? I always forget something. You guys, I'm just blank. Say again. Oh, pinworms. Is it pinworms? Okay, you guys. So <clears throat> remember, you guys, a really common childhood helminth infection are pinworms. And we, I mean, to me, it's fascinating. What's an easy way to diagnose a pinworm infection? <clears throat> Scotch tape, right? Because remember, you guys, at night, the females come out and they lay their eggs around the anus. And that causes that incredible itching, right? And so remember, you guys, we said that you can get a piece of clear scotch tape and press it against the anus, sticky side outward, and that'll pick up the eggs. And then you just put the piece of scotch tape on a microscope slide. It's like kind of like your cover slip, and you can identify the eggs right off the bat. Yeah, low tech, low tech, right? Good, and that's a bonus, you guys. Interob Interobius vermicularis, the human pinworm. Um, so for the pinworm, yeah. when you're asking the question on the test, would you more ask the question as a clinical, or would you have us identify Slide. Oh, it'd probably be a clinical. clinical. Yeah. And you guys, um, I'll try really hard if I ask you clinical questions, like if I have, if I want you to identify like the diagnostic stage, I try to give you some clinical signs and symptoms, maybe travel history. And remember, you guys, all of that's really helpful. Sometimes you know what it is even before you look at the, the diagnostic stage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, because we're a microbiology class, you guys, I would like you to know the scientific name, right? But, but what's the key, you guys? If I say scotch tape, right? You're going to boom right off the bat. It's pinworm. And I know inter interobius vermicularis. That's a tougher one. But maybe just remember, oh, it's the long one that we didn't really practice much. I don't know. You know, there's different strategies for taking these exams. Okay. All right. So, guys, these are awesome questions. Yeah. Oh, Xenopsilla, the Xenopsilla chiopsis, yeah. it's the scientific name for the rat flea. No. But, you guys, if I put um, a flea, um, um, a slide with a flea on it, or a photo of a flea, I do want you to recognize that is a, a flea. Okay? So I do want you to be able to distinguish between a flea and, like, a tick. Okay? Yeah. And, you guys, a, a simple way, a simple way, like, um, not to make you crazy, but fleas are insects, and insects have six legs as adults. Um, ticks are what we call arachnids, and arachnids have eight legs as, as adults. And I know it's like, oh, we're going to count the legs, but it's like if you're just having trouble, that is an easy way to distinguish between insects and adult arachnids. Yeah. So, folks, any, any specific questions? You look so tired. I know you guys. We're going to do this. We're almost finished. We're almost there. Do you want me just to skim my, my study guide? Okay. Oh, okay, okay, you guys. Um, and I'm just, I'm just looking at my study guide here, you guys. So, um, so chapter 9, motility. Do you remember which media we did as a demo? Motility auger. Okay. So, you guys, do you think these two microbes I'm showing you um, – that were stabbed into motility auger deeps and then incubated. Do these look like they're motile or not motile? This looks to me pretty motile, right? Because remember, you guys, the red indicates where the where the microbes are growing. If they were non-motile, they should only be growing along the stab line, right? But see how they've moved into the auger itself? So this, to me, looks like these guys are motile. What's the most common structure used for motility? Flagella. Good, folks. What's a bacterial flagella made out of? Protein, good. And you guys, if we're talking about the sugar toxin producing E. coli, E. coli 0157H7, what does the H stand for? Flagellar antigen. Awesome. Good job, you guys. Okay. So, you guys, we talked about Borrelia burgdorferi, the bacterial spirochete. How are Borrelia burgdorferi motile? 
those endoflagella that makes up the axial filament. Okay, so it's number five on the, the um, motility. Okay. Is Brownian motion true, motility? No. no. And, and you guys remember the flagella arrangements for sure there'll be a station. We'll have you identify the flagella arrangement. Okay, so make sure you review those. Would you have more diagrams or slide classes to identify them? Um, it could be either a diagram or um, electron micrographs um, with what's called flagellar stain, so it'll be really obvious. Okay, good. Good, you guys. The microbial growth media, folks, we've already gone through that. And again, you guys, I'm skipping a lot as we're going through here. Um, but I'm so glad we went over the microbial growth media because I think that was a tough one. And you guys, now I'm looking at um, Chapter 11, aseptic techniques, transfers, and Chapter 13, isolation. So you guys, how would you know in a big butt TSA slant if your microbe made um, gas? through fermentation, what would you look for? Bubbles. Bubbles and cracks. Good job, CKs. Good job. Okay. Um, if we gave you, remember the urine samples, you guys, that you, you used the four quadrant technique to get isolated colonies? Um, a good station would be that we'd have maybe three plates there for you to look at and for you to determine if it appears based on the streak plates, if the cultures are pure or not. And remember, you guys, what folks forget <clears throat> is you need to look at all the quadrants because often a contaminating microbe is in low, lower numbers, and you're only going to see it in quadrant one. So in this plate, you guys, if you just looked at quadrant th uh, three, where the isolated colonies are, you're like, oh, man, it looks pure. But if you hold it up to the light in quadrant one, you see, oh, there's a second organism hiding in there. So make sure you on that station that you look at all the quadrants to see if you can find a second or third organism growing, okay? And folks, do um, do remember how to do the streak plate. Um, say, say we showed you a streak plate where there were no isolated colonies, all the colonies are growing together. Um, be able to um, suggest maybe what your partner did wrong, why they didn't get isolated colonies. And the flip, the flip would be true, you guys. What if we gave you a plate and said, this is your partner's plate and nothing grew? Could you describe why nothing grew? Like a failure of transfer? You guys, can you give me some ideas? Why might, you know, after you inoculate your plates, you incubate and you pull them out and nothing grew. Can you give me some reasons why that might have happened? The loop was too hot, right? You fried your little babies. Good. What would be something that's not in your control? The microbes were dead. Like, we gave you a dead culture. Isn't that helpful? But that's possible, you guys. Is it possible that um, we're asking our microbes to grow on media they can't grow on? Yeah, right? So that's a possibility. Um, sometimes, you guys, and this wouldn't be a big deal, but sometimes microbes are temperature sensitive, so maybe we're incubating at the wrong temperature, right? Okay, good. Of course, the UV? Yeah. Of course, you guys. Okay, so you guys, this is chapter 14. And, and you guys, chapter 14 was a lot. So if you're totally overwhelmed, you guys, focus on the practice exam questions. Focus on those topics, right? Because I know, I know so many of you are just overwhelmed. But for chapter 14, it's such a huge unit, lots of information. Um, I would first focus on the practice exam questions there. Mm -hmm. Of course we can. Okay, so you guys, this is um, the practice, chapter 14, control of growth, um, quiz or exam. So you guys, the first question is, UV irradiation of cells first causes what? Yeah, the thymine dimers. Okay, good. And um, folks, number two, what damage can UV light cause to humans? All of them, right? So eye damage, damage to skin. And you guys, why did I develop basal cell carcinoma? Too much UV, right, as a kid, right? So, yeah, those same mutations are going on in our cells. Good. I mean, not good, but you guys got it, right? Okay. And three, you guys, is, is horribly written. So I would modify it on our lecture exam. I would say, like, in hospitals, where may UV lights be used? And so what I would do is I would specify 
for any location that no one is present, right? That's so crucial. You never want to UV. You never want to use UV lights if humans are present. So you could argue you could use UV lights in all these places as long as they're totally vacated. That's just really important. Yeah. And then uh, four, can UV light easily penetrate the plastic of the petri dish lids? No. And that might be one reason you guys like on a UV station. Um, maybe I'll say, well, here's um, here's your team's UV results. Um, here are the plates one minute irradiation. Here's the plates four minute irradiation. And there's no difference. The UV had no effect. And you're like, what? So what's a possibility? They forgot to take the lids off, right? Yeah. Okay, good. And then, folks, five, how do cells repair damage caused by UV irradiation? There's two mechanisms. Light repair, and what is light repair? Photolyase, right, visible light activates the enzyme called photolyase. And photolyase, you guys, it's just like little molecular scissors. They just go along and they, they break, they hydrolyze the covalent bond between the adjacent thymines. And that lets them reestablish the normal hydrogen bonds with the adenines on the opposite strand. It's like, what a great repair. But usually there's backup repair mechanisms, you guys. So what's the second? Dark repair doesn't require visible light. And can you be a little bit more descriptive? What do we mean by dark repair? Excision, Excision repair, right? So proteins and enzymes are going to remove the damaged piece of DNA. How will it be repaired? DNA polymerase one, right? And then ligase will link the new repaired section. But you guys, does DNA polymerase one still make mistakes? Yeah, it does. So, so we could argue, guys, maybe that's why in some of us where we're getting lots of sunlight all life long, you know, if, you're, if your um, repair enzymes keep trying to repair, 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 um, does that mean you have an increased chance for mutations? Yeah, right? And that might be one reason why we end up sometimes with skin cancer, right? Is it if you got a lot of DNA damage, you got a lot of repair, that's going to increase the risk for mutations. Yeah, okay. And then, oh, okay. So was that, was that okay, you guys, for UV? Okay. Um, you guys look so tired. I know, you're just like so rude. Do you, do you want to go over any of, of the other Chapter 14 stuff? How, oh, I know, you guys. So um, in the dis diffusion studies, do you remember in the dis diffusion studies with our antiseptic disinfectants, do you remember for our class which chemical was best at inhibiting our gram positives? Lysol. Ly awesome, you guys. And Lysol is a phenolic, okay? And then for the gram negatives, you guys, do you remember which was the best? Tincture. tincture of iodine, right? And how would you describe tincture of iodine? Tincture means okay. alcohol, right? And iodine is a halogen, a powerful oxidizing agent. Good job. Okay. Um, in general, folks, what protective structure do gram-negative bacteria have that gram-positive bacteria lack? The outer membrane. Good job, you guys. Um, which, which group of bacteria, folks, would be most resistant to water-soluble chemicals, harmful chemicals? Gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria, or acid-fast bacteria? Acid. Good. Acid-fast bacteria. Good job, you guys. Um, which structure can members of the genus Bacillus and Clostridium make that are totally resistant to antibiotics? Endospores. endospores. Awesome. You guys are great. Would endospores be inactivated by alcohol-based hand sanitizers? Nope. They just laugh at you. Would endospores be destroyed by normal autoclaving conditions? Yes. yes. And do you guys remember what a normal autoclave run is? 121 degrees Celsius. 15 pounds square inch of pressure over atmospheric pressure, 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. Um, can you name a pathogen that normal autoclaving would not inactivate? Good. Yeah, bad, but good. You're right. Okay, good job, you guys. Um, okay, you guys, um, just trying to remember here. Okay, um, folks, to which class of antibiotics does penicillin and ampicillin belong? Beta lactams. What can ampicillin do that penicillin can't do? Good. Cross the outer membrane points of gram negatives, right? So penicillin is relatively narrow spectrum. Ampicillin, moxic moxicillin, 
um, broader spectrum, gram negatives, gram positives. Okay, which enzyme do most do most clinical isolates of Staphylococcus aureus make that can destroy penicillin, amoxicillin, ampicillin? Beta lactamase. Beta good. Can you name a beta lactamase resistant beta lactam? Methicillin. Methicillin. Good. Methicillin. What are what are M M R S A? Methicillin resistant Staph aureus. How are they resistant to all beta lactams? Mutant transpeptase, awesome. And seriously, you guys, this, this really will help on the comprehensive lecture exam. Good. Folks, what is the target of macrolides like erythromycin, clindamycin, tetracycline, and aminoglycosides? They all have the same target. 70 is ribosome. And remember, you guys, we said if you can't remember, like guessing the 70 s ribosome is probably not a bad default answer. Okay, so you guys, if you inhibit the 70S ribosomes of bacteria, which function is knocked out? Translation, protein synthesis, good job. You, um, folks, what, what are the targets of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole? Yes, the bacterial enzymes involved in folic acid synthesis. Good job, folks. Oh, I know. For for um, a bonus, you guys, do you know what carbapenems are? They're beta lactam like. Why why do healthcare providers love them? They can pass through the outer membrane porins of almost all the gram negatives, and furthermore, you guys, they're resistant to most of the beta lactamases. Yeah, but now because we've overused the carbapenems, do we now have carbapenemase producing? Um, bacteria. Yeah. Okay, that's bonus, you guys. Don't don't fret about that one. Okay. Oh my gosh, you guys. We almost got through the whole thing. Man. Wow, I didn't think that would be possible. Okay. Um, so you guys, just really quick, these, these are just some sample kind of lab exam stations, you guys, that I have set up over there. Okay. Let's say, how did I set this up? Okay, you guys, this is PR glucose inoculated with microbe X. Okay. And then I have two theoglycolates. And I'm asking you, okay, if this is microbe X in PR glucose, which of the theoglycolates do you think is most likely, um, most likely has microbe X in it? Yeah, I'm sorry, you guys. So this is, this is B, this is A. Yeah, I agree, you guys. And, and the reason for this is kind of the thought process, you guys, and, and we will be asking you to do this. So in the PR glucose, you guys, did the micro ferment the glucose? Yes, and you guys remember, Louis Pasteur said fermentation is life in the absence of air. So is this telling you your microbe can grow anaerobically? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, right? So in the theoglycolate, folks, remember we inoculate theoglycolate to answer the question, can my microbe grow anaerobically? So where do we look for growth? In the butt. And of these two, you guys, which one do you see a microbe growing really happily anaerobically? This one. Does that make sense, folks? So that's one of the, the sample exam questions. And folks, also on um, Canvas in the chapter 14, no, chapter 16, 17 metabolic test, I put um, a PowerPoint up with practice lab exam questions for you. And also in chapter 14, I put a PowerPoint up with practice Kirby Bauer antibiotic sensitivity test questions. It's probably overkill, but if, if you just want to quiz yourself. Oh yeah, you guys, and, and, and I apologize. So you guys, I made a mistake on the handout. In theoglycolate, we want to add a redox indicator to tell us how much of the tube um, has oxygen present. And I made a mistake on your handouts. I put the redox indicator is resalzerin which turns pink of oxygen is present. Well, obviously that's not pink. Um, the redox indicator we use is methylene blue, and it turns green in the presence of oxygen. 
So it's just we have to verify in the theoglycolate that we've got an anaerobic zone there. If the whole thing is aerobic, it, you know, it kind of defeats the purpose. Okay. So, folks, this is just another practice question. This, these are four different microbes. At, on all four microbes have been inoculated in PR lactose. So the question is, if this is, if, if it runs, you guys, microbe A, B, C, and D, which microbe or microbes can't make beta-galactosides? Good. How did you know that? They couldn't ferment it, right? So remember, you guys, to ferment um, lactose, a microbe has to make beta-galactosides. Great. And then, I think that's almost it. But what happens if you're working with a microbe like Pseudomonas that's a strict or obligate aerobe? So you inoculate two microbes into theoglycolate. Excuse me. So microbe C and microbe D. You guys, which of these tubes is more likely Pseudomonas? C or D? D, because you guys, if it's a strict or obligate aerobe, would you predict it would grow well anaerobically? Should so th with these two, you guys, whoever this is, is growing very happily anaerobically, right? So if I'm asking you which one is more likely Pseudomonas, you would choose a theoglycolate where you don't have good anaerobic growth because Pseudomonas, like us, is a strict or obligate aerobe. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So you guys, I, you know that was not bad, considering what we did that in like 40 minutes. Okay, but again, again, you guys, we will have Open Lab Friday. If we do anything like this on Friday, if, if people are asking to quiz, I'll definitely do a movie because I can't do anything in Open Lab that everybody doesn't have access to. So if you guys are okay with that, I would just film any quizzing we do in Open Lab and then just post it on Canvas. Okay, good job. So you guys, make sure you wash your hands, spray your benches, right? And then we'll see you up in lecture. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Um, ah, oh, sugar. Okay. If in doubt, add it. Just staple it to it because the more you give me, the more points I'll give okay. you. Yeah, okay. Good. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. Hey. Yeah. Canvas, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll post this on Canvas. You got it. And also for my exam. Yes. Uh, because of work. Um, yes. So Monday, 